Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to another online session where we talk about tea and craftsmanship and all things Japan. My name is Gianfranco Kiko, and um, I'm a London-based curator, marketing strategist, writer, and a Japanophile, um, in case that was not obvious. And I work at the intersection of design, technology, and craft, and I'm also the author of the Craftsman newsletter. Today, we're going to be in conversation with Joy Ito. Joy is the co-founder and a board member of Digital Garage, and since July 2023, he's been the president of the Chiba Institute of Technology. He's a digital architect, a venture capitalist, an entrepreneur, an author, and a scholar, and he works to respond to complex challenges such as education, our democracy and governance, and redesigning systems of scholarship and science. He has served as director of the Media Lab at the MIT in the US, and as a director of Sony and the New York Times. And regarding today's conversation, he's also a student of the way of tea, or often called uh, the tea ceremony. So welcome, Joy, to this conversation. There we go. So where are you connecting from, Joy? I'm in Tokyo, in cool. my uh, home slash office. I mean, I've known you for, for quite a while, and for me, it was always the tech component uh, of, of you that resonated. I remember when you were investor at Flickr, um, then you were leading Creative Commons. So I'm curious, how did you get to tea? Because if there's one thing I didn't imagine was seeing you in, in a kimono, in a tea room, in Seiza performing tea. Yeah, so so the, 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 the trigger at the end was a, a recent, so I came back to Japan in 2021 and I'd been away, I've been visiting a lot, but I hadn't lived in Japan for about 14 years. And I've gotten older, <laughs> and uh, and the, my and this is tr true for many people. But being away from Japan, your appreciation goes up. You know, you miss the food, you miss the culture. So it was really kind of great to be back in Japan. And I have a business partner, Hayashi, and he ended up um, buying this. Uh, uh, a res it's not a resort, but it's like a retreat center called Numaza Club, which has Japanese kind of national treasure quality tea rooms. And he realized that he had just bought some amazing tea rooms but didn't know how to do tea. So he he wanted he was looking for a teacher. And one of my mentors, um, Okutani san, um, she's a you know very powerful uh, woman CEO, but she's done tea and she's retiring to focus on being a tea teacher. And so I said, well, you should go to Okutani san. And he said, well, she's scary. Can you go with me? So I tagged along to be sort of his sidekick. And then I just got sucked in. And I think the thing that sucked me in was, you know, because I had was kind of trying to get more and more immersed in Japanese culture. And it was really, and I can, we can go into why, but, but tea, it turns out once you get into it is the perfect lens to see sort of everything. And I, and I think I'm trying to remember, I think it might've been Sadler's book on tea, but there's a passage or it, it may have been somewhere else, but it was basically a passage that says to understand Europe, you have to understand Christianity but to understand Japan you have to understand tea and so like as Christianity is a lens into many parts of Europe they this was arguing that tea is the lens in Japan and I, I really felt that as I go in so and it's kind of there's an infinite amount of depth in every facet so so that's been kind of how I and this was just a little over a year ago that I sort of stumbled in to this path well culturally what when you look at the history of Japan especially between four or five maybe 600 years ago, um, you know, the Ashikaga Shaguns, especially Yosh Yoshimasa was the one that when he um, retired from being the, the, the Shogun, you know, he had a, a 10 year civil war in his hands and he started cultivating a lot of the arts. And it's interesting because you can track a lot of Japanese crafts and arts and the things that today we consider, you know, essentially Japan. In, in that period, you know, the connection between tea and Zen and calligraphy and, and a certain kind of art and minimalism, that was not the case until he started to codify it and, and made it uh, attractive. Yes, to, you know, it, it was a highbrow thing, but then I think it has permeated everything that Japan has produced culturally until, you know, the last hundred or so years where other forces started to take, to take uh, over. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, for anyone here who hasn't looked at Japanese tea, I mean, I think that it, it when you say tea ceremony, it you kind of might get the image of like English tea or you know or tea ceremony where you kind of raise your pinky and yeah. chat socially. But 
but in Japan, anything that has a like the word do, like the path, it 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 feels more like um, um, like a martial art than uh, a, a social thing. And and Japanese, I think, have a tendency to take things very seriously and obsessively. And I think there's a there's a I wouldn't go all the way as saying macho because that was kind of the the unmacho ness of tea being forced being being kind of obsessively pursued by macho people was kind of this kind of weird twist thing about it so it's not macho but it but it's serious in a way that isn't like i don't know how it, it's, it's quite deep and and yeah. and i think that that was that's one of the things even i when i first was looking at tea from the outside it looked kind of it didn't look nearly as deep as i imagined and and you could see people doing it very formally but it but it felt i don't it, it's quite interesting the how much deeper it is once you get in than yeah it, and it, i think the formality outside. is in 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 i mean tea times rather uh, uh recent because i mean riku 400 years ago you know he he was the the third in in, in a, a, a big of waves to change tea to get it more different from the Chinese style and the appreciation of, of certain luxuries. So, by the way, I'm going to catch you, Gia Franco, because it's only in Japan after doing tea where 450 years ago is only recently. Yeah, <laughs> true, true, true. In the true, United true. States, yeah. that's what that what you call only recently. Yes, uh, th that is that is true. Um, but until before that, you know, tea was very fancy, lots of shiny things. And 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 Riku codified was the third in a line. I mean, I think sometimes we put more on him than what he really did. He was the final one of, of a transformation, you know, with, with Murata Juko and, and, and a few yeah. others. But um, tea, you know, he, he, he was a big proponent of tea is the Chana Yu side, right? Hot water for tea. And then we gather and there was no fancy stuff there was a lot of paying attention to things but the ritual side of things came later and as you mentioned um in in japanese you say chado or sado right where do is the path so a more honest translation would be the way of tea uh, the tea ceremony was when early translations into english you know they they lacked the the maybe the understanding of what ceremony meant in in for a western um you know language they changed it into that but the 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 extreme ritual, you know, the, the formality and stuff came later. Tea was, it's always fascinating because tea was a way to get different people together and discuss important matters, maybe prevent a war, even gossip, you know, but, but you know, um, uh, soldiers would get together with, with God forbid, merchants and, and, and you know, and, 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 and clerics, and it was a social thing. And then when it became popular for the masses, especially when, um, when, you know, uh, Hideyoshi was making all these big demonstrations and tea was made more accessible, it became a popular thing. You know, they didn't have pubs back then, but the tea house was sort of the equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I think, I think that's right. And it's, it's, so it, it's, and to, and to your point, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, there's Rikyu and then maybe, um, um, Kukai before, but it's sort of Jap Japanese have these heroes that are kind of pivotal and they tend to happen like once every 500 years or so and i think what's kind of interesting even among so so it's interesting first of all that the tea is on the rise in popularity with men mm. and on the decline with women in japan apparently and for the last round um i think probably post-war the ministry of education and sort of the the the, the bureaucrats turned tea into kind of this thing that women do to become yeah. you know prepare for being a wife you know and that's unpopular as a thing to do whereas the the sort of maybe i can be req2 thing is sort of on the rise so people who are kind of punk rock but want to be punk rock in the context of a thousand years of history are kind of pursuing tea as the way and they're they're really interesting characters who are doing tea and 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 it's interesting because even though you, we talk about the strict um ritual Riku himself was kind of punk rock, right? So he, he, was, was, he was definitely, I mean, rules, not only right? he was goth before the goths with everything black and muted and stuff, but, you know, he was a big kick to uh, what, uh, the, you know, the, the, his, his master, uh, his I mean, his lord, Hideyoshi, who was all about glittery stuff and showing off and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and it, it was almost an insult that Riku was removing all of those things, making the room smaller, removing everything extra um using very humble objects in in, in the tea room i i had a funny um I, I just did this podcast with um uh, i interviewed um kengo kuma 
and he's sort of discovering tea. And he said the very funny thing. So he was like, so Ricky was this punk rock, sustainability, sort of minimalist guy. And he comes up with all these values. And then all these Edo bureaucrats turn it into formal rules, which is kind of aesthetically the opposite of what he was, you know, and, and, it, and he's like, and he was kind of comparing it to people who wear like SDG badges and stuff like that. And, and, and it was, so it was interesting. So, so there's a category of people who are adhering to the rules of Riku. And then there's others who are like, no, Riku wouldn't be doing that. He would be maybe not even doing tea. I want to be Riku. So Ochi is kind of an example of that. So it's, it's interesting to see also that, that like, are, are you trying to recreate Riku or are you now taking what Riku created and then being the, the follower of it? And it's a very different view into that. Yeah. And, and you know, I titled this session uh, from, from tech to tea, because even if you look at one of uh, Riku's students, Furuta Uribe, he was also um, quite a, a challenger, right? So he's cha changing shapes and colors and parts of the ritual. There's, um, there's actually uh, this, this manga, I'm not very much into manga, but when I discovered a manga from the, the samurai area from the Sengoku period that was all about tea and not fights, Kyoge mm -hmm. Mono, um, they also made an anime out of it. And it's all about uh, Oribe's life um, mm -hmm. and how he was uh, probably, a, 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 you know, um, a hedonist and, and loved a lot of the, 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 the whole search for the objects and pleasures and stuff. But he was changing things. And the same way that when we talk about technology, you know, innovation is that tricky word, right? Innovation... Um, starts at a certain point, the same way as traditions start at a certain point. I often point out that when you use the word traditional, you're talking about dead stuff. Well, tradition, mm -hmm. things that have tradition, they're alive and they're constantly changing and they might not be the same thing that they were a hundred years ago because the whole point of tradition is they start and they evolve and they have to pass it on. Well, traditional usually is the old way, the old school way, and, and it's stuck in the past. And tea has gone through that, you know, it's with the mm -hmm. super codifying things starting to put labels uh, before we started uh, the, the the recording we're talking about things like wabi sabi that first of all in japan they wouldn't use both words together but wabi cha was um a, a, a way to stand out from what was normal back then and now mm -hmm. it became a label applied to things oh that's so wabi sabi and stuff and mm -hmm. and you were pointing out that maybe especially talking about this four or five five hundred year cycles maybe mm -hmm. we're coming up to a new one right yeah yeah, I was, I was, yeah, and we were talking about this a little bit, but uh, earlier, I think it was in January, I, I, I saw, I had dinner with um, Hoso San, who is, uh, I think, sixteenth or seventeenth, maybe some teen generation of of um, kimono obi, and then he brought uh, this guy named um, Yamashina, who's the thirtieth generation of the Yamashita, fa Yamashita family, and they're the stylists for the royal family. There's two, and so it's about a thousand years ago. And so kimono used to be this multi-layer, huge thing that you couldn't walk in. So his family sort of consulted with the royal family back then and said, okay, well, let's reduce it to like three layers, which is basically the underwear, mm -hmm. and then unlocked their ability to walk. And then about um, uh, 450 years ago, Rikyu's period, when, when they reunified Japan, so there's this thing called the Monsuki Hakama, which is you put the family crest on a black kimono, and then you put these pants on. And... Um, and and he said he has a log of Ieyasu and and his you know ancestors talking about how you know now that we're you know we, we've ended the warring period and we're sort of consolidating and you want to kind of get all these warlords all lined up looking nice let's change it and create Monsuki Hakama and then and then Riku comes in and brings in this sort of wabi minimalist thing and and there before that you have Miyabi which is kind of the thing that you were talking about glittery and fancy and so there's this these two guys you know sitting there talking about, well, the Miyabi's kind of cool and we're kind of getting tired of Wabi after what, 500 years. Maybe we should make a change, you know? And, and it's interesting how, you know, the, he was talking about a thousand years ago and 500 years ago. So there's like this hundred year cycle, which is, you know, the Meiji restoration and the World War II, where you kind of reset local like layer um, culture. And then there's this kind of 500 year cycle of like basic aesthetics that seem to change. Because if you go back 1,250 years ago, you have, which was the anniversary last year, is Kukai's anniversary when he brought Shingon to Japan. And it's and what's kind of interesting is the families are all still there. Like you, you, you mentioned Oribe, you know, the, the guy at my university who runs a robot lab 
is is Furuta, and he's a descendant of of Oribe, and and he still has tea balls in his house, and he you know, and it's and and so it's 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 all very matter of fact, and it's all recorded. So my my partner Hayashi and I, the same guy who bought the 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 tea house, um, we we there's a female artist named um, Komatsumiwa, and she draws these amazing paintings, and so we help we sponsored her to commission a a, a mandala to go into. Uh, the uh, Toji Shrine for the two uh, the twelve hundredth and fiftieth anniversary, yeah. and it's only the second cycles. time that they had accepted artwork as a donation. So, and the last time was eight hundred and fifty years ago. So they said, "Well, where should we put the sponsors' names?" And they, and then the monk was like, "Well, let's see. How did we do it last time?" He said, oh yeah, we put it on this box, you know. But it's all like these five hundred year cycles are all kind of a matter of fact, and it's it's both good and bad because I think this is what is the leads to the kind of conservative, unchanging, happy with what you have nature, which leads to, this is why we have 400 Michelin stars in Japan. People are happy to just make the thing they have better. But it's also why we don't have Facebook and startups. This is, I'm trying to tie it back to the tech. I mean, I think tech, a lot of tech comes from entrepreneurial spirit. And entrepreneurial spirit is about, if it's not growing, it's dead. And in Japan, the thing is, well, no, actually growth is overrated. You know, sort of flourishing in place is what you what you what you get, and that's how you get a thirty year, a thirty generation family. Matter of factly, talking about changing something after five hundred years, you know. But then I wonder, um, because both extremes have something interesting, but often we suffer in the middle, right? You have um, things you create and you put out digitally, or even the hardware you put out that in five years time is is not going to be around, or or you know. Um, I wonder what's going to happen to all the photos we publish online in, in not 20 years, but a hundred and stuff, you know, it's, it's the, the usual thing. If an alien comes and they look at, you know, what, what we left, you know, all our digital stuff, is it going to be there? Because it's not designed to last the hardest and stuff, you know, they're, they're, they cannot be sustained um, alone. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you have these unchanging things, which are great. I think we don't do it as often, um, uh, you know, to reflect and look back at things. But I wonder how do we get to that middle point where mm -hmm. the, the, there's a bit of the innovation of tech, which is amazing. We see that in, in things like medicine and, and, and transportation mm -hmm. and, and, and things that can have a lot of value for society. But then a bit of, of uh, unchangedness, um, you know, is also good because mm -hmm. it's, it, it can be quite tough. You know, we, we, we live between 80 or 100 years, depending where, where you're in the world and stuff. And, and sometimes things change too quickly, right? You often see people struggling to figure out how to use a phone. I remember with QR codes, my, my mom was struggling because before she didn't need QR codes, during the pandemic, QR codes were compulsory and she felt left out. And, you know, she's relatively young uh, compared to 500 year cycles. Yeah, I, there's a great phrase that Sir Brand uses called pace layering, where you've got, you know, nature and culture and, you know, governance and, and, you know, and 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 then at the top you have fashion, and and you have these like if you think about it from architecture, you've got the plot, you've mm -hmm. got the superstructure, you've got the inner structure, you've got the tenant, you've got the event, and so and each layer moves at a different speed, and the fast layers are important, and a lot of attention goes there, but the base layers like culture and nature are actually what drive things, and and I think that you have different cultures focus, different com communities and regions focus on different layers in a different way. And one one metaphor that I like to think about is, you know, is kind of it's like Japan has a aesthetic and a strategy and the strategy may not be so good for startups, but it's good for other things. And mm -hmm. if you think about evolutionary dynamics, like, for instance, drug resistant bacteria don't suddenly emerge in the presence of of, of antibiotics. They are already there and the antibiotics kill the ones that are susceptible and the drug resistant ones emerge. And so it just turns out the strategy that wasn't useful suddenly becomes useful in in the presence of things and so so i feel like japan has a certain aesthetic and a strategy that wasn't so useful for a certain like web 2 but it may be useful when we start worrying about climate change and war and maybe the this kind of like being happy with what you are worrying more about getting along than about competing this kind yeah. of non-competitive cooperative thing because i think cooperation and competition are both essential for healthy uh, evolution but we've kind of opted towards focusing on competition because it's fast. And so, so I, think, I think there's one is kind of to think about it as a strategy. 
And then on the aesthetic side, I think what one, this ties, it's a sort of orthogonal, but I'll, I'll mention because I think it's related. So in Japan, um, what you tend to do is go extreme. So like, like you've got like minimalist and maximalist, you know, the maximalist is Akihabara and the minimalist is, you know, Ryoanji Shrine, the stone gardens, but you also, there's a food is really interesting. So most cultures like you're, you see, you should tell me if this is true, but I, when I cook Italian food and I learned about it, you want to salt balance all the way up. So when you're doing the pasta, when you're in the sauce, you always add salt all the way up. Whereas in Japan, you take the salty stuff and the bland stuff like the rice and you don't mix it until you put it in your mouth and you keep these contrasting like hot and cold, salty and bland, and you keep all the contrast separate, no and kabuki, and you mix them when you get it, which is a very different approach to contrast than many other cultures, I think. Well, well, it's funny that you, you mentioned Italy. Um, so when, when I moved there, I was originally uh, brought up in, in, in Argentina. So um, my father was Italian. So and I realized when I moved to Italy, that a lot of things we did at home, how we ate and stuff was very Italian. But I was also paying attention to the differences. And then when I started spending time in Japan, uh, I noticed two things. First of all, both are very, very similar. Uh, the geography, both of them are very narrow and long countries. The difference is that Italy is attached to the continent at, at the north and Japan is not. Um, they're both, you know, have central mountains that, that divide the country. Um, there's not one Italy the same way that it's not one Japan. You move 50 kilometers and there's a different culture, there's a different history. They, they do things in a slightly different way. Um, and they'll tell you that their neighbors, you know, 50 kilometers from there in another city, don't know how to do the tempura or something. Italians are the same. And both of them, yes, they had a royalty and aristocracy and a very culture, well-cultured elite, but they were mostly farmers, right? The, the, the hardcore part of the, of, of, of the population were farmers and, and lived in scarcity. And today, what we admire the most, if you go to New York to an Italian restaurant, is usually what initially called cucina povera, so poor man's kitchen. And people that figure out how to do the most with the little they had, because they couldn't eat meat. The meat was for the Lord if they had any. So they had to figure out how to bring the biggest uh, uh, impact on the little they had. And they didn't accept to be miserable. And this is similar in Japan. I mean, I always wonder who was the first person that decided to eat bamboo shoots or a lot of things that, you know, wouldn't seem fancy. But then in Japan, they've been elevated. And I believe it's because there's this commonality with Italy that they don't accept to be miserable because they don't have much. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's that exploration. But then there are key differences. You know, one uses olive oil and butter. The other one uses soy. So the salt thing, I'm, I'm going to have a better look at it. Uh, because in, in Western cuisine, you often present a dish that is already final, right? There's nothing mm -hmm. for you to do except maybe put a bit of extra seasoning or, or I don't know, uh, Parmesan cheese on top. Well, in Japan, most of the things are almost... a uh, uh, do it yourself you'll get a, a tray with five different things and you decide how to balance them in a way you want more salty you eat more of that and so there are some commonalities but then very key difference in other things but that's why i believe that italians and japanese when they talk about food well they taste food they can relate very much you know what is umami umami is very strong in in italian culture even though they don't talk, talk they don't use that word but then circling back to, to tea, um, mm -hmm. there's so many things that tea created uh, culturally and then abandoned. I mean, uh, until recently, uh, probably still today, the easiest, most common way to drink tea in Japan is out of a plastic bottle from a vending machine, right? You have amazing uh, uh, coffee houses in Tokyo, but it's very difficult to find a good tea house. I mean, there's some traditional ones, and there are a couple that have emerged recently, but there hasn't been anything like the third wave of coffee in tea mm -hmm. in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder, right, because uh, uh, tea feels in a way more relevant, a, a part of the health benefits, um, um, feels more relevant to modern life, almost in a way that, you know, like in a video game, you upskill and you unlock different things and stuff. In tea and tea culture, there's a similar thing with mm -hmm. objects, practice, or even kinds of tea that you, not out of snobism, but you had to learn first how to master the lower ones then access the other ones otherwise you won't get it you know the first time you go for koicha the very thick matcha and stuff mm -hmm. it, it's not something that you say you enjoy you know uh, because it takes time to understand what it is and why you're being exposed to such an intense flavor yeah well i i think i think part of it is that um because because a, a lot of the people that i'm um now practicing tea with are people who first were sort of almost forced to take it by their parents in order to prepare for 
you know, being an adult, got sick of it because it's sort of a boring way to learn it and then rediscover it later through kind of our network. And I think it's sort of, it's the, the it's been branded as this kind of thing that you learn as a high school student because you're a woman, right? And and so it has this stigma of, well, it, well it, it not a stigma, in fact, being something that's sort of this training for something that you don't really want to do. And, and, and then the other thing that's interesting is because that's a substantial part of what T is branded to be, the people who are kind of getting into it kind of hide from that, right? Yeah. So, so it's yeah. a little bit underground. And, and so, so to, to actually discover people who are having tea for fun, you kind of have to look and stumble into it. And now I think more and more people are talking about it on social media. So it's starting to pick up and people are saying, oh, wait a second, there's this aspect of tea. And then I think for young people, it's just most young people, even you know, all of us, I think are rebellious when we're young. And so tea seems either as kind of this you know, anti-feminine thing, or it's this very old person's thing. Yeah. And so I, it doesn't seem cool. Whereas, you know, coffee is pretty new in Japan. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have this kind of stodgy feel to it. And so I think from a fashion perspective, and, and also just kimono is also very old fashioned as obviously, right? It's a medieval clothes. So, so you know, wearing kimono also feels like something that your grandparents did. And, and, it's, and so, so, it doesn't have like this youth following, which is kind of what I think, whereas coffee, I think is, is, it's, it's, it's much, much cooler. You know? But you start to see some, um, there's, there's a brand, uh, I can't remember its name now, uh, tea style or something like that, that, um, you know, is reimagining kimono for daily life where if, if, you know, if, if you're uh, in an office or, or in a building or something, you want to go to the toilet and stuff, you know, you don't want to be undoing the whole kimono thing and stuff. So they're reimagining it. And it's, it's quite cool because, I mean, we've been doing that with suits, for example, you know, uh, yeah. for a while, nobody wanted to wear a suit. And now people might go for an unstructured night, nice blazer, you know, and, and they'll seek the the dying Italian, you know, tailors and stuff or British tailors for that special thing that then actually when, when, when you remove all the cultural baggage, if it was something for older people and stuff, they feel amazing. And, you know, with global warming, I mean, I would love to, it's not a, it's not a kimono, but I would love so, to be so, able to wear a yukata. So, so. And, and and this is a slightly the difference between doing tea and kimono in Japan versus elsewhere, because in Japan, you have the kimono police and you yeah. have tea police who will come up behind you and just like, you know. Well, but abroad, then... <laughs> abroad, you'll have the cultural appropriation police. You know, if I wore a kimono yeah, yeah. on the streets, you'll say, oh, what are you doing? You're not Japanese and stuff. Like, well, uh, you no, know, I don't. I mean, I don't wear a kimono, but I sometimes wear a, a samua, the 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 working mm -hmm. ropes that yeah, monks yeah, yeah. use and stuff. And they're very comfortable, especially if I'm working from home, you know, and, and yeah. if it's warm, uh, it, it doesn't get too hot and stuff, but it does raise an eyebrow and people say, oh, are you pretending to be Japanese? No, it's just comfortable and I like it. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm, I'm sort of skirting this line right now. There's a, I think one of the brands is Wise and Sons is kind of a, a, a new style. Yeah, kimono. that's the one, yeah. Yeah, and... Um, but I'm very scared to wear it because um, I'm I I worry about you know uh, you know and and I, I I walk very close to the kimono police, right? yeah, yeah. but um, but 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 then what's interesting is you and this is kind of bad and all Japanese typical thing. But what you do is if you find somebody who's in the lineage, and you put them in the car with you, or you know then you're allowed they they protect you from the police, you know, and it's this kind of funny dance that we do but 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 it's it and, and i and i haven't been doing tea enough to actually have a you know well thought through answer to this but i've been sort of poking it and if you were allowed to do anything you wanted i don't think it would be here 450 years since it, sure. i mean part of it the the police kind of keep it pure um but part of it is but 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 that's what ricky did is he changed it right so sometimes people have permission to change it and the permission comes after you have mastery, and yep. then you can change it. You know, and and so I I think that 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 um, then you all, you've always had derivatives, you know, that kind of go off, and I think that's okay. But the but the core, the strength of the core comes from par partially from the policing, and the adherence, and and I think that you know the with with t bowls, the, your appreciation increases significantly once you start to understand why and who and where yeah. and that that requires quite a bit of work which is sort of the other side of the coin of of you know it's 
cool and comfortable, you know? Yeah. And sometimes we, we, we don't want to be patient. So this, the, this is, is true in many, in many crafts, many, especially craft families or dynasties. I mean, the, the Shu Hari, right? So Shu, the first step is to copy and you copy your, your, your master and, and you have to master that. Then Ha is almost going the opposite way and, 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 uh, um, um, being opposed to almost everything you learned. And then there's the Ri, which is finding that new balance where you're probably contributing something, not because mm. it's not so much ego driven, but you know, by mastering the, the way things are, then exploring mm. almost the other extremes, then you reach a new balance, which sometimes has to do with, with the times we're living in and, and other things more attuned to, to the culture. And, you know, it's it's i mean you see this in so many things right we we take a course a, a two day course and then we feel that we are great at something and we want to change it and stuff and this happens in design a lot um happens in tech with the difference is sometimes in tech maybe because it's and, and we're talking about digital tech because it's younger i mean it's, it definitely doesn't have the, the hundreds of years of legacy um and it's driven by experiments and and market proof you know Nobody cares if you did the opposite thing, you know, then you look for validation and then it stands in its own feet, which is very different from, from T where the validation, the respect and stuff are, um, you know, it's, it's not market driven. It's not how many teacups you sell, you know, or how many, mm -hmm. I don't know, people gather at, at, at a tea house. Yeah. And, and I think that is very much part of the um, um, flourishing without growth. You know, mm -hmm. like you say, shrine is not about getting bigger. It's about the fact that they've been rebuilding it every what, twenty years, yeah, twenty years for a thousand years, you know. Or, but what it's but it's kind of interesting because they all have innovations to keep the flourishing. Like one of my favorite stories is I went to visit um, the Raku family that have been making bowls for four hundred fifty years, and I think it's the sixteenth generation now. But it's very funny; they're the only family that does this. But what they do is um, um, they they don't pass on the formula to the glaze to the next generation. So each generation has to rediscover the glaze, which is, I think, and, and, and so Raku compared to other families has much more variance by between the, 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 the generations, but they all have it, but it all holds together wonderfully, you know? And, and I, I think what's, what's interesting. And I think it, it's partially being in an Island nation. That's the end of the dead end of the silk road that really can't grow, but lots of stuff coming in. They all have to, they're all kind of in tight quarters and have to get along. So I think if everybody wanted to grow in Japan, you just kind of explode, you know, or or Japan became imperialistic. And, and you know, and I think for Japan, its happiness comes from, you know, being in very close quarters, but being happy, which then you have to discover. And I think that's, to me, the 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 the, the superpower of Japan that might be helpful in kind of the sustainability conversation, because I think most cultures, it's hard to be happy if you're not, you don't get to try to grow, you know, yeah. and and. And what you end up with is shinier stuff, tastier stuff, hardcore stuff, because you get your you pursue happiness by going deeper rather than by going bigger. You know, and, and it's interesting because the the the, the expression uh, happiness is a tricky word, right? And is how we understand it now is very new. Once upon a time, you know, in in the eighteen hundreds or seventeen hundreds in 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 England, if you were born a farmer, you know. That was your future, right? And and it is almost similar to the caste system in other places. So you are not, you know, uh, worrying too much about that because you were just trying to be content with what you had. And and happiness was a different thing. And and I think that contentment, being being satisfied with what you have or what you do or, or certain things, is important. Well, when you don't have a boundary, there's always someone that will have. I mean something more than today than than you or that seems that they're having a better time i mean that's sometimes a challenge with social media you can see someone having a great time you don't know anything else but that instant of their life that they see oh they're having a great time in dubai you know mm -hmm. and and that generates frustration and and i think I, I i think i'm sort of explaining it sort of like as if it's all great but i think for any thing there's always the upside and the downside right because just as you said with the caste system japan basically has a caste system, you know, and people are happy with it, but it's not necessarily always good. You don't have social mobility. You still have high level of chauvinism. You have resistance to change. People aren't entrepreneurial. So, so you, you have a lot of downside. And I think what's, and, and you sort of were talking about this a little bit, but I think what would is kind of key is for us to be able to move around and either pick the culture pieces that are useful for the thing we're trying to do, or to be able to, you know, do the, 
to, to basically have diversity. And I think one of the problems with a lot of the tech stuff is it's sort of flattening a little yeah. bit of the culture layer. And I think we're, you know, it, 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 it doesn't allow us to, uh, uh, you know, cross pollinate in the right way, but maybe, maybe I'm just being a, 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 a a downer on this. I, I think you, you. We also just going a little bit back on the how we ended up with T thing, is you know when we were starting the internet back in the old days when we were doing Creative Commons and stuff like that. I mean, I remember you know, we had global voices. If we could just connect everyone, we would be happy and have democracy. And it was, and we were so techno utopian and um, optimistic. And even if you try to design it to be good, isn't good. I think the you end up also then starting to realize that there's other stuff that needs to balance it, and and I think the the journey that a lot of us techno optimists went through from the '90s till now, you know, ends puts you in a place where things like pure experience and all the things that are that that are you know on the other end um, seem to make sense in a different way. Well, I mean, um, you know, we, we touched on this, but but the the, the tea houses that Riku was proposing, not only they were small, so you had to be in in close contact of of the other people, but especially when they were used for uh, discussing important matters. I mean, it was designed with a very small door; you had to, you know, uh, uh, kneel down to get through. The swords couldn't couldn't get into the place, so there was almost a, a leveling off. You know, we're all in a very small place. We all have to follow certain rules. We're all going to be drinking uh, usually from the same tea bowl. You cannot demonstrate your power with with the swords and stuff. Your staff has to stay outside. Um, and then there was that intense human connection, which these days, when a lot of our communications are mediated by by uh, a, a device, is almost the opposite of that, right? It's easier to be mean to someone uh, when you don't have to face them in in a two and a half you know tatami room or something like that. And I find that sometimes what what I I enjoy of tea is um, the proximity, the feeling, you know, the feeling the tea bowl, the smelling the incense, the paying attention to what the host has done for you, which might be on the scroll they picked. And you realize that all those things are not random. Someone is taking care of you is all, almost the opposite of what's happening with customer service, where we're trying to remove the human from it and automate it because it's more profitable and, and humans are, are messy. Uh, mm -hmm. Tea brings a lot of that messiness in a controlled environment. It's not just anything goes, but it allows you to almost celebrate the best of, of, of humanity in that contained space. It was designed for that um, mm -hmm. and not for, um, I don't know if profit is the right word or growth is the right word, but you know, it's, it's almost like we, we, we lost all the boundaries and the, some boundaries were very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm just right now building a tea room at my university and we you know we have a pretty large space and everything like that but we, we were looking at various different sizes but I decided to go with almost the smallest one possible exactly for what you were saying because it doesn't really change if it's look if it feels like a classroom it doesn't change anything but it's the fact that if we do tea you're going to be here yeah and we're going to be in such a small room which is going to be asymmetrical and, and brown and kind of the opposite of the rest of the place. And so it's kind of like this completely different world that you're entering. And if it feels at all like the rest of the world, it isn't, it doesn't have the same effect, you know. And a bit of that scarcity and limits. And and that's I wanted to touch actually on on the frustrations with you. So you come from this, you know, tech-infused culture and in, in, in two different worlds in Japan and the US uh, and everywhere through through tech. Um but then, you know, you are studying tea formally too, you know, so you are going to, um, you know, um, tea practice and you have to learn certain things and rituals and stuff, you know, that are there. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about how was that process, you know, because uh, you you decided to do this. It was not forced on you, you know, when you were a kid or, or maybe it was back then. How How is going from this, everything is possible. So no, these are the rules. It doesn't yeah. matter if they don't make sense. You have to first learn these things by almost by heart, and and uh, to even have a chance to then change anything. Yeah, I you know I think it, part of it is my interface with tea is a lot of it is my personality, so I'm somewhat obsessive, and I I really like to learn complicated things as kind of a it's it's an interest driven learning thing, and the thing that's interesting about tea is it's frustratingly deep and complex, and you know so with like tea ceremony like just the movements. At first, you're just learning 
the motions. And then you sort of learn why each motion, like the order of things. But then once you get that, it's like, no, 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 your fingers should never be splayed. No, your back should be straight. And then and then when you do this, the sound should be this way. And then like Rikyu's when in his hundred verses, no, when you put something down, you should put it down as if you're letting go of something you really love that you don't want to let go. And that has to be the feeling. And then and heavy things should be lifted as if they're light. And light things have to and, and so there's an infinite amount of polish that you can put on and and you don't even notice it until you get to the next level and you get to the next level and and what you realize is that just it goes all the way for like you could and 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 like carving um tea scoops there's like an infinite whole lifetime of that and so for every little piece of tea ceremony there's like an in, infinite amount of otaku obsessiveness you can go and in fact historically once you start to learn the the history of everything you you can actually identify the person that did this thing obsessively and you can then find the artisan in kyoto who's making the who's the god of saws which is the perfect saw for cutting the end of the tea scoop that you can you know and 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 so so for somebody who just and and it, but it's all well structured and learnable but you can't learn it easily and then the the other thing and and, and yeah anyway but it's just no, but that's why I thought, you know, um, uh, you you are or were an avid video game player and stuff. And it almost feels like every 70, you know, there's the level, there's the boss, you know, at the end of the yes, level yes, and stuff. And then when you think, oh, I, I got it, I defeated the boss, then no. And this is this new thing. So this this constant upskilling and locking new things yeah. and that you thought that were not useful or, or didn't make any sense. And, yeah. and, and so my sister actually wrote, she says she does a lot of interest-driven learning as her thing. And... I think this was when she was in university, she wrote a paper about Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon. And her thesis about why they were so um, compelling to kids is kids like to learn and they like to teach each other. And when you create a world that has an infinite amount of detail, um, there's an infinite amount of learning and things that you can do. And so a lot of the Western stories are quite shallow. Mm -hmm. And in in Japan, they really like to uh, allow you to be obsessive with abandon, you know, and and so you got this endless detail, and that's what the kids were getting addicted to, you know, and and I think tea ceremony is like the ultimate version of that. So if you're it's if a more expensive Pokemon. Pokemon, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also but the I, fact I, that I, yeah, you have to be very, I mean, uh, um, you know, the from the move fast and break things to the tea house, where actually you want to move very slowly, you want to be very considerate of everything. You know, it's 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 still a game in a way, but the rules are very different. Yeah, yeah. I, the 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 I was with Ishihara san, who's the CEO of Pokemon, a couple of days ago, and he he gave me a a, a, a it's a sake book cup that he um, made that has a little Pokemon ball, and then he did the calligraphy on the box and did the, and 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 I was like, it makes sense that the CEO of Pokemon is into you know. Uh, and 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 what's what's fun is that in hakogaki you know right and you write the calligraphy on the back of the box that sort of commemorates the date and there's this whole ritual around sort of the collection and the transfer of things mm -hmm. um and and i think that's also you know and we talked about this a little bit but it's it's the 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 the, the obsessiveness of taking care like half of tea ceremony is just taking care of your stuff yeah. and 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 tagging it and making sure that you know and so you've got like hundreds and hundreds of year old stuff just being used and i think this is also for me was really quite stunning because you have all these utensils in most of the time in most places would be behind a museum you know yeah. glass yeah. but because tea ceremony is so good at taking care of the stuff the way that you participate in the craft is by actually using it which is which makes you feel like you're getting woven into history rather than observing it it's you know? amazing i remember i was at a, a tea house in uji on the uji bridge um at suen uh, and it's considered the, the oldest tea house in japan and the the current head of 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 the the family in the tea house he is probably early 40s if not late 30s he was a dj and then you know at a certain point he decided to take on the the the, the family the family business behind him and he's preparing tea you know sitting uh in in the tatami in front of you there's not much ceremony there i mean you go you can go for a quick tea uh, i'm sure they might even do in the tea room even tea uh, matcha lattes or something like that but behind him there was this pail that actually Riki used to use when he went to uji to pick up water from the river to then make tea and it's just there and i was chatting with a dear dear friend 
who works in the in the in academia and museums are saying, what they have it just there behind him? What if someone breaks and says, well, but that's the whole point is the caring and using and keeping and stuff does break, you know, and, and stuff, you know, um, um, the you know degrades and stuff. Not everything lasts forever, mm-hmm. but there's um, there's both this tension between the being very present in the moment and and taking care of this to the also thinking and projecting, you know, a hundred years into the future, how are we going to make sure this is still around? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I, I want to get into some of the punk stories of what do you yeah. think are the current punk stories of tea? But uh, someone was uh, put a question here in the chat. Um, and, you know, now we're talking about how in tea, you have to pay attention to everything. It's even a uh, reward to do the things yourself. Eventually you'll make your own tea scoops and, and, I'm, I'm trying my hand at making mediocre tea balls, and I'm very good at making mediocre tea balls. Uh, hopefully, but but you know, and all comes through my interest in tea. But you know, the this is very slow uh, and 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 human intense. And on the other side, we have a trend now with especially generative AI, where we almost don't want to illustrate things anymore. We don't want to do them by hand. We don't want the presentation. We want to outsource this. And now this is, a, is the peak moment, right? Where everyone this, there was a cartoon that said. Um, you know, to whatever uh, chat GPT kind of thing, please turn these three bullet points into a 40 slide presentation. And on the other side, there was someone saying, please turn this 40 slide presentation into three bullet points. How, what do you think of this trend of trying to automate everything and remove the, the, the human craft from it? Yeah, so, so I, I, I go back to um, that point I made about minimalist maximalist. There was this period where, and I think it may still be true, but, but where a lot of kids were wearing Unicro and like, um, you know, Hermes together. So it was like, it was high contract, super cheap and super expensive. And even this um, bowl that um, the Pokemon CEO gave me, like a lot of it is super high craft, but then he said he made the Hanko with a 3D printer. You mm. know? And, and also with tea, you have two categories of stuff, stuff that should last thousands of years and then stuff you throw away every time. Yeah. And so, so I think that there's like this weird combination where the stuff that you really don't need to be focused on, um, you might automate. And then you pick the layers where you're being obsessive. And so like, I, I was a DJ and I remember a lot of people when I was DJing back then, they'd say, well, that's not art. You know, you're just putting on other people's music. But in fact, there's an art to that, you know? And so instead of spending time learning how to make the records, I spent time learning how to play the records. And so, so I feel like if you decide that your creativity is at this layer, you might use a tool for another layer. And, and so I think it's the combination of things that are, comp- so, so for instance, when I, well, after we did this Toji sh- um, temple donation, um, that they decided, okay, well, we want to give you an NFT as well, you know? And so <laughs> I think this kind of high contrast is pretty in- interesting. And, and, and so for me, I guess my, my thing would be, you know, like, it, so it's, it's fun watching sort of AI find its way into nooks and crannies to become a scaffolding for sort of obsession at a different layer as well, right? Because I think there are certain things you can do now with AI. If you just go AI all the way down, I think it's a little bit boring, at least with the current tools, it's a, it's kind of boring. Yeah, know? but then, you know, um, you, you mentioned the NFT. Um, 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 I know a British company called Provenance and what they're doing is not exciting at all for the public, but it's very important. They're tracking, you know, the ingredients that go into a products and stuff and everything is is uh, on, on, on the blockchain. If you think about these records you were mentioning earlier, 400 year old records of these people came to tea, we use these objects, you know, all, all that detail. Um, they were done by hand because there was no other technology. Lucky that some of them survived the, the multiple fires, you know, in, <laughs> through the centuries, but both things could live together. It's just that sometimes, it's true that the incentives, the financial incentives, today are skewed in one direction, yes. right? And, and and probably there's that rebalancing that is needed, understanding what is enough, what is good enough, mm-hmm. you know, what is valuable, um, even if it doesn't produce profit, which going back to the model of Japan, Japan has made lots of interesting things, but has since the 90s uh, and the birth of the bubble has lost a lot of the financial bets uh, to, to mm-hmm. call them somehow, you know? Um, but but I'm curious, you know, uh, we, we talked about this 500-year cycles, how, you know, we, we probably over-appreciate certain things, you know, um, uh, wabi-sabi, which was not a thing, or kintsugi, and now everyone's thinking that you're melting gold to fix pots, which has nothing to do with it. Um, what are some of the punk things that you are, because I always thought you were a person with a great instinct to 
figure out things that were up and coming mm-hmm. and then invest in them. So what are some of the punk stories you can think of in the world of tea? Yeah, I mean, I, I the, 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 the one, I used to call him a kid, but he's not, I don't, I, I'm in the middle of pivoting away from calling him a kid, but um, 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 Yoichi um, Ochiai, who is a media oh. artist, so he's pretty punk, you know, he is making tea rooms where the floor is such that if you do nijiri, your, your kimono gets shredded and the tea bowl's made out of plastic. So if you put hot water in it, it melts. And and he's his goal is to try to be what Ricky would have been if he were here today, at least his interpretation of that. And, and he's quite anti-authoritarian and punk. And it's it's kind of interesting. It's in, it's interesting that he's going into Shingon um, Kukai and 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 Riku are his heroes, and and so that's a that's a that's a yeah that's that's I think an interesting interpretation. Um, you know, I don't see a lot of punk rock in T, but 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 actually, well, it was a little bit. I mean, I think I think there's a there's another there's like interesting T subcultures, um, and so there's like the main branches of T, but there's smaller T schools and then you find people doing tea ceremony that the, the problem and this gets back to kind of what we were talking about with the police if you get if you get too far out um you, you're no longer connected to the trunk so you don't have as much influence on the thing that you're trying to like the, the, the authorities are no longer listening to you but if you're kind of annoying the authorities just the right amount um then you have more impact on the system and so i see people kind of fiddling with either the fashion or like bringing in uh, modern artists in a weird way. So, so this 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 is kind of an example. So I was I was at um, uh, a a big um, tea ceremony uh, last week at Nezu, and um, Fujita is a um, is a, a a museum, and they were doing one of the tea ceremony things. And so, you know, but he he had set up the tokonoma so that it was like it, it, I, I I don't want to spend too, too much time trying to describe, but it, but he had like a a, a Buddhist statue where instead in, where the lotus leaves were broken off from the statue so that they had lost them. So on the floor, he had scattered lotus petals. And so it was like a little installation art piece, but he had bro- broken a bunch of rules by scattering petals. Mm. And so you see like some percentage of the senior tea people like, and then other people like, holy cow, you're, and and so he, so and and a non tea person would wouldn't notice it at all, but among the tea people, there was this kind of rustling, you know, and 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 this is like trying to take a four hundred year um, rule and like break it slightly, and I find that's actually and then and then for somebody who's just getting into tea, being able to understand what the whole fuss is about is yeah. kind of otaku and interesting, but but you but what's cool is there are young people who are into it enough that they get the joke and they then have a whole conversation about it and then it triggers the tea ceremony combo, you know? And I think here's where Japan and historically they have can use external collaborators better because if you look at a lot of the things they made in the design and what we call the design work today, they were, you know, Japanese craft and technology with a foreign designer that in part mm-hmm. because they were foreigner, you know, the police were not, was not so much after them, but they were able to bring it into this world and, 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 and change things. Uh, it has happened a lot in in uh, even in in I don't know so much about the tech world, but I'm thinking of things like cars and stuff where you get the best of Japan, but then it it having a foreigner gives you the license to make it slightly different. and then then Japan loves it because then it comes back even so many fashion designers, Japanese fashion designers went to Paris because they felt they could be freer yeah. from the police and invent something and then they're revered back home. but it would and- have never happened. Yeah, and and that's totally accepted as a thing in Japan, right? It's actually revered. So once, if you can go through Paris, it's okay. Or like I don't, I, I don't know if you saw um, the Mary Mako tea ceremony. So the Finnish designer Mary yeah. Mako did a whole thing, and and a lot of Japanese love that, right? So so, and I think Japanese love it when somebody loves Japanese culture, as long as they're tasteful and famous and get it right. It, yeah. it super amplifies. So I, I think that's totally right. And I feel like, um, you know, like if you go back to like ok- Okakura, Tenshin and, and like like the Gilded Age, there seemed to be a lot more of this. And, I don't, and this, I'm going to turn this into a question because you've studied this more than I have. You know, I wonder if it was the difficulty of transmitting stuff that made that 
east west connection works so well like i have a lot of fabrics that went from you know india to europe and back to japan and is the is the flattening making it harder to do what you were just talking about about going back and coming or, or is is it is am i just yeah, not i mean is it close when the world was it depends you could call it smaller or bigger when traveling and stuff was more difficult you know the yeah. there was a latency in the police so okakura I, in fact the book of tea was written in english right and he was finding his peers um a, a, abroad and mm -hmm. he could discuss things matters that he wouldn't have been able to discuss or present in japan because breaking through was very difficult yeah. now that everything has in a certain way leveled and connected and everything is in sync it's becoming sometimes more difficult to have that suspense, you know, for a moment of, oh, let's let's work a bit this out and then we'll try, we'll fail a bit. If we fail, there's no big deal. Nobody's looking at this and then you can break through. And I think curiosity, imagine, um, you know, today, if, if someone travels to Japan for the first time, they probably have watched films and anime and whatever is their favorite thing and stuff. So some things feel less surprising. But yeah. imagine in the 1800s traveling to a world where, you know, in one place you walk with with swords and the other one, you know, they've never seen a sword and, and they're dressed in a different way. They eat different things. Well, one thing that's kind of annoying as hell, but is exactly what you're saying is in tea ceremony, you're not supposed to teach other people things. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they if I say oh, I learned it on YouTube, they say, oh, well, that, that's not going to be good. You know, and, and actually, I, you know, I first got... I got my first like credentials from tea ceremony and I, and, and they sent all these and I said, well, I haven't learned how to do these. No, no, those are credentials to learn. And so, so they're very secretive and the highest rituals, they don't, they, they're not, you're, they're secret. And, and that I think is part of this kind of trying to slow down the collapse, which allows it to retain yeah. some of it. Your but the Yamato system was also um, um, a smart, business model you know back then yeah, so you had someone yeah. at the top and you had to get license for everything and stuff so they were kind of protecting this different business which that's right on one yeah. level is important because the 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 the, the tea master was not selling the tea i mean the merchants were maybe maybe making money with it or the objects they're selling the knowledge and selling knowledge is very different how do you codify yes today you can go to uni and and but even then you know a lot of the courses are online so you're paying for something different not the knowledge really so i think was making the most out of a system, guaranteeing that there was some continuity, but also that these people could have a living, right? And, and activities like preparing tea that you could compare with the industrial world were quite humble. You're not creating financial value and stuff. They could be quite prestigious and you could actually live on those. While if you try to be uh, um, um, someone that makes tea or coffee in, in the Western world today, you're gonna struggle. You know, you have to create the Starbucks change which was not about coffee. It was about, you know, maybe the franchising, the real estate and whatnot. So I think it's a tension with adopting a model and believe that that model is everything and not being willing to, to challenge it. Now, we're kind of close to the time we had planned. There's a couple of questions that have been dropped into the chat. Let's see if... Um, so this one, you, you mentioned this, this uh, um, powerful businesswoman that now is retiring and looking into tea. And someone was asking in, in the Q&A, um, what what do you think is attracting men and women to get into tea? You know, yeah. after maybe a very successful life from a conventional conventional perspective. Yeah, I, I I do think it's it's kind of like a good video game. Um, like I remember Richard Bartle, who did Mud, said there's like four character types. You know, there are people who pursue the lore, people who like self actualization, people who like PvP and competition and people who like to socialize. And I would say tea is probably the same. Some people are doing it because it's an interesting social endeavor. Some people are kind of obsessing about learning how to do it, self-actualization. People are collecting. So I think it's very different reasons. Um, I think that there's some people are doing it for status because it's kind of like a, a, a so so I think it's it's really very different things. And what I've started to also do is really pick my tea friends. Mm both for why they're into it and then because you I, I basically I've, I've been finding a huge diversity of reasons for people getting into tea um but but you still but but you you find a group and then you it start to amplify and and what the sorry I'm just jumping around a little bit but the other kind of interesting thing is there aren't that many people into tea so once you 
people find out you're into tea, you get invited to these really weird, very secretive things. So right now I have like this, you know, like two or three tea ceremonies a week sometimes. And they're all very unusual and very interesting. So as an experience and a weird way to network, it's also kind of interesting. I think this um, um, Oktani-san, I think she's been doing tea for a long time. And so she's building this whole like community around her of mm -hmm. her students. So there's this kind of, I wouldn't call it empire building, but there's a whole, and the, like, especially as you get older, there aren't that many things that where you can kind of build a, 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 a sort of a, a, I don't know how, how you use like, yeah, or, or like a, a team. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, once upon a time, you know, uh, if, if people had a mass, for example, a big collection of artwork for themselves, they would create a museum. Um, just, so there used to be these things where there was a bit of giving back. There was a bit of consolidating for whatever's the next step. There was a bit of enabling others. You know, you might become a, a patron of the arts and, and allow other people to rise. So I think there's very different things that could motivate people into tea. Um, I mean, for me, it was through, I mean, um, there was an interest in tea before I even cared about Japanese tea per se. Um, I do have a strong interest in craft and tea is a great vehicle because I don't like, no, let, let me, um, it's not about... Um, craft as art, which actually in Japan until the 1800s, there was no word to differentiate craft from art. They were the same thing at, at different, expressed in different ways. There was highbrow and lowbrow, but um, but I love to experience craft, <laughs> right? So um, uh, if, if I have a tea bowl, uh, some, once someone asked me at, at, at a fair if I was a, a maker or a collector, and I sometimes make tea bowls and stuff, but they're very bad, so I wouldn't call myself a, a maker. It's true that if you have more of one thing that is uh, non-essential, if you have more than one tea bowl, you're a collector. If you have a couple of pebbles, you're a collector of pebbles. But I see myself as a user, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's I love to use, you know, when I try to, uh, if we're talking about tea bowls, you know, I want to keep them in rotation. Some of them are for special occasions. Nothing as extreme as having a tea bowl that you only use once every two, 12 years, you know, because they represent whatever mm -hmm. zodiac animal. But, you know, um, but I love to be a user of things and through tea, I'm discovering, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm practicing more calligraphy, shodo, you know, and, and, and going to the tea room is always very challenging. First of all, because I cannot understand what it says uh, because of how it's written. But then once you do, you discover a whole layer of meanings that before you just thought it was a beautiful. So, so, so by the way, funny thing, I was just reading um, as part of my Japanese studies, um, this book by Sen Nosoku and and he has this great thing in it where he was saying back, like in Rikyu's day, they have this thing called the, um, um, the I guess it's uh, Chakaiki, which is the log of the tea ceremony. Hmm. And the Kakejuku, which is the calligraphy, all of these logs back then didn't say what the calligraphy said. It has a, the size, the color, and they used, people used to bring, the, the people who recorded would bring these rulers and measure it, but they didn't know what it said. And, oh, wow. and it's, it's, it's so interesting that, and because there were a lot of illiterate people back then, like me, and, and, and what was funny was it's only recently that you're sort of expected to know what these things say. <laughs> but, but pro possibly the host was picking them for a particular reason, uh, yeah. at least in theory. No, the, yeah. I, I'm sure the host knew what they were yeah. saying, but I think it was like, and it could, I, I can't, inf I'm trying to guess whether people were too embarrassed to ask mm. or whether they weren't expected to know, but, it, but it is interesting that kind of it's, more modern Japan, where you're sort of expected to be able to read some of them. Yeah. So yeah, and and then you know when, when you look at the more artistic or or, or um, the the Zen practice of of shodo, um, it's more about mood and energy than, mm -hmm. than it's not kaisha yeah, style, which is very blocky and it's very mm -hmm. easy to read and it's almost like like printed, right? So yeah. especially in in Zen, um, you see a lot of things. I remember one about bamboo and stuff that has no resemblance but it's actually from their perspective more true to the essence of what they were feeling when they were thinking of the bamboo you know in in, in the wind or something mm -hmm. and the calligraphy is in between uh, um, objective meaning you know the word and tacit meaning the feeling um joy i i've loved this there were a few more questions that came in um um i'm, I'm just going to mention two of the quick ones not to steal too much of your time one says do you have any tips for a visitor to Tokyo on where they can experience tea? Um, it depends really on kind of what, sort of getting back to the thing, what element of tea that you want to do. Um, uh, you know, so so if you if you happen to luck out um, 
the the Mizu um, Museum um, has uh, sometimes publicly accessible accessible tea ceremonies, yeah. and you literally are touching you know museum level uh, uh, tea bowls and things like that, and people will explain it, and you can find tickets. So I would look at Mizu just Mizu Museum for for their schedule. Um, so that's probably like if you're interested in the utensils and the history, and um, a lot of uh, uh, tea schools uh, also uh, have classes and other things for um, non-Japanese speakers. Uh, I think Urasenke is the largest, so most likely to be able to find something. And um, many tour guides also um, can set you up uh, with a with a good tea ceremony. Um, many of the uh, like if you go to Akasaka or some of the um, Ryote, which are rest, fancy restaurants, often will do some category of tea ceremony. It's a lot easier to find in Kyoto. Kyoto, just about every other place you go to, has some version of tea ceremony as part of. Yeah, their, what is difficult is to be invited to the, the to the tea room because some of them have the 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 front one where you can go and order tea and there's a menu and stuff, and then yeah, you yeah. can always peek and see. Oh, there's a private room and stuff, but there's yeah. no button to request that, you know, and you have to yeah. But but I guess the key is just to say you're interested in tea yeah. ceremony because then people will help will help you and I think yeah. I think that that's like and and the more you get into it the more likely they're going to take you to the nice Definitely. tea room. <laughs> but as you said, there's different levels because for example, if you're into tea, the 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 substance, you know, the, the tea leaves and stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. Ogata has been creating some modern tea houses where all I the see. focus is on on the tea, the product, you know. So you have. Uh, Higashiya and Ginza, which is about Wagashi and mm -hmm. tea, you have yeah. Sabo, you have uh, the Sakurai tea experience, and they're all very different. Uh, I could recommend them or not yeah. for very for, different reasons. Or Ipodo, right? Yeah, yeah, Toraya, if you like Wagashi, you know, yeah. Toraya, especially in the Yakasaka one, uh, the, they pay a lot of attention to, to the tea side of things yeah. too. Um, yeah. But it really depends. Sometimes, you know, I what I missed, and, and Higashiya from Ogata has it, is I was missing a place like a, a coffee house where we can catch up, have good coffee, but it's mostly for conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to a, a famous traditional tea house, you, they're not expecting you to be there chatting with friends for two or three hours, yeah. right? Yeah, so true. even though that was originally the point, you went and gathered with other people, you know, uh, in a tea room to chat and gossip. Mm -hmm. um, so true, there's very, very layer, different layers and, and um Chatting to people and 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 asking and 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 being humble in in your requests. It's not about the money and stuff. Does often open a lot of doors. Yep. Um, so the last question, um, it's can you reflect upon what T means to design research and re research through design? And it's a tricky one because I I don't know how to interpret that one. So research through design. So what, yeah, what T means to design research and research through design. Uh, I wonder uh, through T experiences, yeah. if you can. Yeah. yeah, well, well, I think so. So again, my favorite book for interrogating this, at least so far, is the 100 verses of Rikyu. And um, he it's just little tips on why you do this. Um, and what you realize is that for every little rule that may seem kind of peculiar, there's a very functional reason behind it. So there's like this form function thing. Mm -hmm. And and weirdly, tea ceremony is beautiful, but it's always the absolutely most efficient way to do the thing that you're trying to do in some version of efficient. And Riku obsessively figure, tries to decide where, and, and like each thing that you put down, you have like little rows on the tatami mat. They're specifically defined. So when you put the, 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 the top holder, it's, three links in three links out and the and so, so it's all defined but but it's all actually extremely exquisitely designed so it's not there's nothing random about it and like a detail rounds of, of the tea world uh without the, the challenge is that you sometimes don't get the 10 principles beforehand so you cannot understand why but yeah, it's been, yeah. there's a grid and, there's a perfect designer's grid in the tea house too that, that's right but but then there's this kind of imperfection that's also built in right so that so so nothing is symmetric you know and 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 the rules about the asymmetry like you should never put wood on wood you should never put this with that and then there's also even with the seasonality like you should do this but you should only if you have a flower here you shouldn't have a flower on the bowl you know and there's like all of these rules but they all make sense either aesthetically or functionally 
Yes. And you can sort of see how it evolved. And then if you go, and then once you start to understand it, and, and what's really this wonderful thing is when you start to like, like for instance, when you hold the, the wastewater bowl, you turn one way. When you hold the tea bowl, you turn another way. But it's because you don't want the guests to see the wastewater because it's dirty. And as you start to learn the rules and then it clicks suddenly why this is this particular way, there's this kind of unlock and, 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 and we're no longer answering the question, but, but, but I guess the question would be that, that I think tea ceremony was designed by some exquisite designers who are doing some form of research. And it wasn't just because, because, which is what it feels like when you first start learning it. <laughs> also because we now know the final shape of it, but I'm sure they went through iterations. And you sometimes, when, when you read some of the logs, there's, there's a, an old book uh, called, I think stories from a tea house window or something like that that a friend recommended a few months ago and it's a compilation of what you do what you don't do and some sometimes they say um oh before we used to do this now we do this other thing and stuff so there was an evolution it's just that when you see it without living in the history you just see the the conclusion mm -hmm. uh, and the conclusion was very seldom a random thing that someone said oh i wanted to be this way because i just like that color yeah exactly um, Joe, you know, I, I could talk about tea for hours and hours. Um, uh, we don't have the pr privilege today, but this is fascinating. And especially fascinating because we started with this, right? Tea was seen as this very old school thing, only for old people. But it has a richness and it's very fractal. I mean, you can go down lots of rabbit holes. If you're a visual person, you have that. If you're a tactile person, you have that. If you're someone who likes to create things, you have that. If you just want to follow the rules and be passive, you have that. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that at least in different pockets of, of the world or maybe my world is it's, it's coming up because um, the, the world would be less interesting if tea and what tea represents, not just the beverage, but all these other disciplines, you know, mm -hmm. would be less rich if, if they were not out and about. Yeah. And, and, and I think tea ceremony is now as a university president is probably the, the place where you can be the most punk rock without getting police to come after you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Joy, thank you very much.